formerly a chemist, has been working in the physics department for the last 20 something years. How long have you been in DCU? Uh, 20, <laughs> 28 years. 28 years. Um, he's not a member of the Institute of Physics in Ireland, if anyone wants to have a go at him over that. But uh, he has been a, a stalwart, uh, uh, I suppose, colleague in physics, and he agreed to come out this morning and tell you about what his work is, and is very much industrial focused in semiconductors. So I hope you enjoy it. Professor Greg Hughes. Thank you. Thank you, Willis. Uh, now, uh, I was meant to tell you about my work, all right, and I can assure you that it's really exciting and really interesting. But in the interest of keeping you awake for 20 minutes, I've decided to talk about the, the wider context in which I work, which I think is an interesting story, and uh, a little bit, little bit, shall we say, more engaging than, than what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm going to look at the role of the semiconductor in the information age, and it's been absolutely pivotal to the, the way information technology has developed. But what the interesting thing is about this whole technology is that prior to the invention of the first transistor, which is made of silicon, the basic components necessary to make a computer existed. All you needed was something which would allow you to rectify AC into DC electricity, and uh, an amplifier which could be used also as a, digi a digital switch on off which is all computers do uh, noughts and zeros the problem with these devices were they were beautiful to look at they were made of glass uh, and you needed to evacuate the area because it, they required electrons to jump across a gap and electrons don't jump very far or don't move very far in air so these worked, and they worked very well, and there's actually people who still believe, in some hi-fi uh, uh, geeks who believe that the best amplifi amplifiers are still these, these triode valve amplifiers, and not, I see some people nodding, and not semiconductor amplifiers at all. So they're not geeks, okay, right, so. Uh, and this was one of the first computers made, it was called the ENIAC, and it was, it was built, and this is an actually interesting year, 1946, because of what I'm gonna talk about later. But this computer was built in the US, and in fact, I just happened to be leafing through a copy of the uh, Saturday's Independent of, I think, a week ago Saturday. And in it, I don't know if anybody reads it, but there was a, a profile of like 100 influential women. Anybody see that? 100 influential women. And I just was leafing through it. And it turns out in the 50s, in number 50-something, was a lady whose surname was McNulty from Donegal. And she, as a... As a um, as a child, she had emigrated to the States. And I just, as I was reading down it, I saw ENIAC, this word ENIAC. And she had actually done computer, well, she did mathematics. And she worked as a programmer of this computer in the States in the 50s. So it sort of was an interesting link. But this computer weighed 30 tons. It had 18,000 of those valves from the previous page. And it consumed 150 kilowatts of electricity, OK? Safe to say that no matter how poor your mobile phone you have in your pocket, it has got more electronics in it than was in this ENIAC computer from 1946. And as I say, that, that year will become important as I go on. So um, one of the things I thought myself is when I began to work in semiconductor physics is what's so special about silicon? Why, you know, we've, we've another 100 elements in the periodic table. What's so special about silicon and what it can do, and why did it underpin the information age? Well, the more I thought about it, I, I, uh, and, and if you look at the reality of what has happened, it turns out that if you think of most traditional methods of manufacture, what we do is we use, proper, we use materials because of their intrinsic properties. We use glass in a window because it's transparent. We use metal in wires because metals are inherently good conductors. And we can shape them, like you make, we can make a car of metal simply because we can form it and shape it and so on. You know all the reasons, right? But we don't give glass its property of transparency and we don't give metal its property of conductivity. However, what scientists succeeded in doing with silicon is they succeeded in controlling its conductivity. And it's a, it's a, it's a very good example of the first time that scientists could control how a material behaves. And that was the secret, really, of, of the discovery of the transistor, because the, the user controls how it conducts, yes or no, on and off. And that was uh, is the first example. 
So if you think of silicon then as a material, it's essentially still, and even though its, its demise has been predicted over many, many years, in fact, I started my PhD in uh, 79, and I was told, forget about silicon, it's gone, we have to move on to new materials, <laughs> all right? And we're still, silicon is still the most important element in semiconductor device fabrication. It can be made extraordinarily pure, less than one impurity in a billion atoms. There's nothing can be made purer. And indeed, it's the purity which actually led to its ability to opt to, for us to control it, because then we could put in the impurities if we wanted. As I says at the bottom, if we introduce impurities, its, electro, its electronic properties can be controlled. And that's essentially the key. It's a little bit disappointing in a way, but that's the key to why silicon underpins the information age. Now, this is, these are the three guys who um, invented the first transistor in 1947. And it's interesting because it's only one year after that ENIAC, that massive ENIAC computer was made in 46. Now, there's two things I want you to notice about this photograph. First, the guy sitting at the bench, he's the guy who did very little, all right? <laughs> he's the guy. So does that remind you of anybody maybe in your school who tends to turn up at photo opportunities when something is discovered? And the next thing I want you to look at, uh, look at it is, look at these guys, look at their age, all right? These guys are not from your sort of internet whippersnapper entrepreneur generation, right? These are old guys with receding hairlines, right? So it gives hope, right? <laughs> it, it gives hope to older scientists, right? But it turns out that it, there's no surprise that it happened in 47, and there's no surprise these people were older, because what happened was, during the war, uh, so many scientists were focused on military uh, research. Uh, radar, uh, as you know, obviously the bomb. And these were very bright people, and a lot of them, no, no more than in, 40, in, in 45, there was a demobilization of troops out of, the, out, of the, out of the armed forces. There was a demobilization of scientists out of military labs. And Bell Labs, these guys worked in Bell Labs, and Bell Labs, uh, was the lab laboratory of the telephone company, which had a monopoly on telephony in the States. They were an extremely wealthy company. And what, the reason they wanted the transistor to work is they wanted to get coast-to-coast -coast communications, New York to San Francisco or east-west coast, without having to use those valves. They weren't even thinking of transatlantic. Right? This was coast-to-coast -coast US. And it, this was a very good example of an applied physics project, because they knew what they wanted. And this guy, Shockley, who was extremely difficult to work with, he came up with the ideas. He was the ideas man. The two poor chaps at the back, Bardeen and Bratton, they had to make it work. And they tried and tried and tried. And it was an extraordinarily frustrating process. And this was Shockley's basic idea. And it's a very simple idea. And he said, if I have a piece of semiconductor here with a very small number of electrons in it, and I, I have, have, a, have a battery and, and some sort of uh, resistor in the circuit. When I, uh, if, the, if the electrons are very well spread through the whole material and I, tr and I try to uh, force a current through it, the current will be very low. However, if I could put a plate somewhere close to that piece of semiconductor and bias that plate uh, positive, if I could pull all the electrons up to form a thin conducting channel at the top of the silicon, if I could do that, I'd have like a thin metal line and then this would be conducting. So that was his, was his idea. I could then turn something which doesn't conduct very well to something which conducts very well by applying an external bias to a separate circuit. And that's essentially the idea of the field effect transistor. And they couldn't get it to work. They couldn't get the electrons to pull up to the, to the interface up here. They couldn't get it to do it. They tried and tried, but eventually, in uh, the 23rd of December, 1947, they got it to work. All right, how many people are working on the 23rd of December? <laughs> but no, but in, on 23rd, they got it to work and they got, the, 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 uh, they got the, 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 the management of Bell Labs down and they showed amplification using this thing. And the strange thing about it was they couldn't patent it because it had, the idea had been already patented in 1935 by a German group who couldn't get it to work, so, but they filed the idea. Bell Labs weren't too happy about this right, because they were obviously a commercial company that invested a lot of money. But the other, and this is it, this is the first transistor which they got to work. And it was actually made of germanium, not of silicon. But what I like about this is, this was the wealthiest research lab in the US. And what's that there? A paper clip. 
You can tell the level of frustration these guys went to to get this to work. They were going to use a paper clip to hold the whole thing together, right? So it was an extraordinary achievement, and they won the Nobel Prize for it. But, but as I said, it was made of germanium, not of silicon. And, and that's it. That's the, that's the transistor, and it, 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 it showed amplification. And as I say, all that's happened since 1947, essentially, is that has been made smaller and smaller and smaller. So the first example of when uh, those transistors were integrated into um, mobile or, or, or mobile electronics was the first portable transistor made by that well-known company Regency. You ever hear of them? No. Well, the third line might explain why. It, they marketed it for just under $50, and they never made a profit. And that's not a great way to run a business, right? But what's interesting, you can't read this here. This is about, this was the ad, the region says. It says it's in a smart plastic case. When is the last time you heard plastic described as being smart? <laughs> All right, smart plastic case. So if you scale this price up here to, to, to today, it would be at least a factor of, of 10 or 20 if you scale it up. You're talking about between 500 and 1,000 uh, dollars or euro. So it's your, it's your, this was your iPhone of the generation in terms of, uh, of technology. And it had just four germanium diodes in it. And the reason they couldn't make a profit is that these uh, Texas Instruments, which as you probably know still exists as a company, one of the few companies which still exists from that era, they w were making these discrete transistors and selling them to this company. And they, the, the cost of production was so high that for $20, for, for 49 they couldn't even make a profit at that, at that price. And I sometimes think of the sort of, if you look at the uh, social history, if you think of, uh, of, of, of rock and roll music, and, and uh, as of present, you'll all remember these people, right? Uh, Bill Haley and Buddy Holly. Uh, I wonder, is it a coincidence that, 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 that a lot of the, the, the advancement in, in rock and roll happened when people were allowed to listen to a radio outside their parents' sitting room where a radio was a large piece of wooden furniture. It was almost a, yeah, it was a piece of furniture in your, in your house. And you could head up the field with a few cans or probably bottles at that stage and, and, and listen to this radical music w with your friends. So, but the key to success, the key to success of the development of, the, of, of, mic of microelectronics, the first part was the invention of the transistor. But the second part was, and it wouldn't have worked without the development of integrated circuits. And integrated circuits is essentially a printing process to make semiconductors. They're all made in a silicon wafer. Intel start with a silicon wafer and make the whole thing in that wafer. So it was 1961, a guy called Jack Kirby in, in Texas Instruments, look at it. That's it. That's the first integrated transistor, it, in, integrated circuit. It looks like a something a student would make, right? But eventually, Fairchild and so on, the, the technology began to evolve. And it's interesting that it was employees from Fairchild who left Fairchild who set up Intel. And these were the startup companies of that era, of the early 60s. These were your, like your, 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 your Googles and your Facebooks. And they got, they looked, they needed venture capital. And they got the venture capital from the military. All right, from the state. It was state venture capital. It wasn't venture capital companies. And they got a lot of money to build this technology because the military, you know, for command and control applications, they, they wanted um, um, e e electronics. And it was Kirby, he, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in the year 2000 uh, as he invented the first the Texas Instruments. And all, as I said, all that's happened since has been this relentless drive to reducing the size of the transistor. And nobody has been better at that than Intel. Intel have aggressively scaled the transistor generation after generation after generation. It's now that they're getting into difficulty, but they've been saying that for a very long time, so nobody really knows. And there's a talk later this morning by uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Tony Cafola, and he'll talk about some of these things, these carbon nanotube things, which uh, they're, they're, they're hoping that might solve some of the issues they're, they're addressing now in terms of the whole scaling. But, the key message is this, the field effect transistor has essentially remained unchanged for 45 years. All it's done is it's become smaller. So it's, scientifically it's a little bit boring, but technologically it's a marvel what they've achieved. All right, so let me just give a quick uh, preview of the technological advances. As I said, in the, in the 50s, Texas Instruments, one transistor was $20, <coughs> around about 20, they were selling them to the military anyway. They sell them for $20. In, a, in a, even an average PC now, you've got a billion transistors, and the microprocessor might cost 200. 
If you work it out, it costs less to make a single transistor than print a single letter in a newspaper. And that's not a letter to the editor, that's a le an alphabetical letter. All right? So it's hard to get your head around that, that a two euro for your newspaper and whatever it costs, remember remind me, letters they've printed, it costs, it's an extraordinary achievement. There's no other industry has, that such, has achieved such economies of scale, if you like. Uh, here's a red blood cell, and in the middle of the red blood cell is a, is, a, is a six transistor memory cell, and this is like of 2007, that's old hat now. I mean, they could put at least four or five times that number of transistors in that, in, in, sitting, in nesting in, in a red blood cell. Uh, here's a nice uh, sort of a shrinking diagram of, of the technologies from 80 all the way up. This dimension here is a micron. There's 80, 85, 88, 91, 94, 99. 2003. There's no point in me going on because it's, it's, I, have another, I have another, what, 11 years to go and it would all be blank. All right, they'll all be blank. And this is another interesting thing, the complexity of fabrication. In the, in, the, in the 80s, what they're doing here is highlighting the number of elements that the semiconductor industry used to make a chip. All right, so you've got a few, you've got obviously silicon and a few dopant atoms. In the 90s, you've got some other, this is uh, tungsten and tantalum and... Uh, uh, titanium, these metals are very common for people who, who uh, uh, fabricate chips for connecting all the chips together and so on. But look what's happened in the 2000s. There's been this been explosion of elements that have been explored for integration into chip technology. And it's the best example why research should be done in universities, because there's no way a company, no matter how wealthy they are, can cover all the bases. Over 60 elements are now at least been uh, reviewed or previewed for integration into chip technology. And that's an extraordinary range of materials. And we work on some of them, so that's all I'm going to mention about my, my research. Uh, as you probably know, they, they, at the moment they make chips on wafers which are 300 millimetres in diameter, size of a dinner plate. They're talking about going to 450, the size of a large pizza. All right? But, and the, idea, the, the, the logic is simply driven by increased volumes would reduce cost. That's all has been their, their driving force. The problem with these wafers are enormous. If you drop one, you know, it, it could be worth a million dollars, the wafer when it's completely processed. One single wafer could be worth that. The production plant could cost in excess of $10 billion. So how many companies can even compete in that end of that market? It's, 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 it's a big ask. Uh, one machine they use for the printing, the printing, the, the, the lithographic printing on, on something that big, the, the prototypes are $75 million each. And, the, and a company like Intel would probably need five or ten of them. Right, so, so the costs are colossal. So now looking a little bit forward and what I'm supposed to be frontiers. Right? I mean, server farms consume enormous numbers, m amounts of energy. Server farms, as you know, are owned by the, comp the likes of Google. Uh, by, you can rent time on computers that uh, Amazon use. And these server farms are just vast buildings with tens of thousands of computers inside, all generating heat. And reducing power consumption is a key objective. Apparently, one of Google's biggest overheads is its electricity bill. But I, I found that on a Google search, so I'm not sure they're telling, <laughs> they're, I'm not sure they're telling the truth, right? Uh, flexible electronics. This was something which has been around for a long time and sounds very attractive. You, 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 don't, you know, the, the new, I just saw last week the new Apple uh, large screen. You know, you couldn't fit it into your pocket. It's, it's a very large screen computer or a, a phone. If, if you could make it flexible, you could maybe roll it up. And so, so, so this idea of flexible electronics is very attractive. And uh, there's a whole area separate from semiconductor physics, which is organic semiconductor devices. And organics tend to be more pliable, more, more amenable to be bending. Silicon, made ultimately of glass, tends not to be that bendable. But, but, so there's a lot of work, but it, it hasn't really reached its potential, though a lot of work's ongoing. Wearable electronics, you know who he is, of course, with his silly looking glasses. It's not clear how they're going to, you know, they're, they're being apparently uh, being, uh, deployed at the end of this year. It's hard to know. Uh, touch sensors. Uh, prosthetics, uh, where they actually link into your, into your, into your brain. All this very high-end, very sophisticated, very uh, complex uh, interactions, all using semiconductor materials and devices. Uh, energy harvesting is very big. The whole concept, what energy harvesting is, is, um, is um, uh, capturing energy from the environment. Um, in other words, then you need very, very low-power devices. So you have uh, you energy harvest, 
you store it, you use ultra low process, uh, low power devices, you might have sensors linked into it. You could do things like continuous environmental monitoring. Uh, this was a silly idea I saw, mobile charging with a leg brace. You know, we got, le we got rid of leg braces when we cured polio. I can't see people wearing a leg brace just to charge their mobile phone. All right, so energy harvesting, this is the idea, convert that energy into, into electrical power, operate. So the idea is that you would have these ubiquitous sensors, very, very cheap, sensor technology that you just put everywhere, in roads, in buildings, in the environment, and they send signals back to, to, to some center and you continually monitor things. It's not very attractive to companies like Intel. Intel make a very good product, but it's expensive. They don't want to make uh, uh, chips costing you know, 50 cent or 20 cent each. They, they, they're at the premium end of the market. They, they want a, a lot of money for, for their devices. Uh, you've also heard of the Google self-drive car. I mean, who knows? Uh, they say they're safer than having drivers. Uh, remote control micro air, micro air vehicles. The US military love these type of things. Uh, little, little machines that you can, uh, you can uh, uh, um, fly with, 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 with sort of uh, image recognition cameras and so on. Here's an interesting variation on that. Uh, the Robo Roach, all right? You connect a, a cockroach to a, a circuit. Seems cruel, but then nobody really likes cockroaches, so I mean, <laughs> it's, a, it's an insect cyborg, right? And apparently what they can do is they can, you, you set that, throw that thing in the air, and you can remote control, you can control its flight path. So you can sort of have a, have a sort of a kamikaze a roach hit into the wall or something like that, if you didn't particularly like them. Yeah, this, a lot of this stuff comes from this uh, sort of balmy website called uh, Backyard Brains. So what does the future hold? I'll try to finish up now. Uh, how will the semiconductor device impact on our lives in the future? Well, one sure thing is it will, it will impact. If, if there's two driving forces in, in, in semiconductor physics now, in, in technology, it's one is speed and the other is power. They're the two key aspects. <laughs> if we could reduce power by a factor of a, 10 or 100, and certainly 10 is feasible, it's hard to know will 100 reduction in power be feasible, you could have vastly improved lifetime for batteries. You wouldn't have to charge your phone every other night. It would be every month or every two months or every three months or whatever. Ubiquitous sensor networks, that idea that I was talking about in energy harvesting, low power, is key to achieving those objectives. Uh, people speculate on what could happen if we could in increase speed by a factor of 10 or 100, maybe real-time speech translation. I mean, there's people who tell you, though, now real human translators tell you that machines will never... Uh, properly translate language anyway, but nevertheless, a lot of this stuff is speculated about what extra speed, and of course the answer is really nobody knows, because nobody really realized what the impact of technology would be currently. I mean, it's ironic that a lot of these companies, like Google, well certainly Facebook and, and Twitter, it's all about communication, ultimately. So electronics are just being used to facilitate communication between people, which is a pretty old concept, right? Uh, people talking and communicating. So just to conclude, uh, there's no, there, it's, it's safe to say, it's, 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 it's a fact that semiconductor uh, devices have transformed the way we socially interact. There's absolutely no doubt about that, and work. Uh, the cost issue means that high-tech manufacturing sector is increasingly dominated by a small number of powerful uh, companies, but that's true in software as well. Look what happens when a startup, successful startup, occurs. It's just bought by one of the big, big companies, so it's no different in hardware and software. And uh, continuous device scaling would provide new opportunities. There's no doubt about that. Where they will be, I don't think anybody really knows. So on that note, I'll just finish up, and thanks for your attention.